Uh, thanks very much for coming along, uh, everybody. My name's Tom. I'm uh, uh, an executive in the Science Party. I ran uh, in the federal election in the seat of Watson, uh, and that was very fun. And uh, we wanted to get some engagement and get some people together to talk about one of our cool policies uh, and one of the really exciting things about the Science Party, which is the space policy. So that's what we're going to do. Um, to help us talk about the space policy, we've got some, uh, some three awesome speakers that will tell us about their role in Australia's space policy and perhaps some thoughts about uh, Australia's role in the space industry, Australia's role in space policy and Australia's role in the international space policy. I wanted to mention a few things before we uh, get into it. Uh, next month we have an AGM. Uh, the Science Party AGM, which you're all invited to, and you're all encouraged to be here. It will be in this room next month. Us. Well, not this room, over there. Sorry, this this building next month. Um, uh, obviously, there's a, some decisions and stuff that will uh, get made, but the agenda will come out very soon. You guys are all invited to be a part of that. Suggestions for the agenda. Come along, get, in, get involved. Uh, one of the things we'll be talking about is state branch, a New South Wales state branch. Uh, we're calling them uh, stem cells. It's a working title. Uh, <laughs> thank you. Uh, because we're going to get, uh, consider getting ready for next year's New South Wales Council elections. So we're going to think about running in those. Uh, so that's one of the things that we're uh, going to do. Uh, we encourage you to join the Science Party if you haven't uh, yet to get involved. Uh, talk about it on Twitter, talk about it on Facebook. Uh, Facebook Science Party discussion page, lots of places for you to uh, talk about science, talk about policy. I don't know if you saw in the news recently, um, but Emma Johnston, who is the uh, Deputy Vice Chancellor for Research, or RESERAC if you read the website, Research, um, for UNSW, has just released a, um, a discussion piece saying we need more scientists in politics. Uh, we agree completely, and here we are, let's do it. I uh, just wanted to give you a quick intro to the space policy, the Science Party space policy. Uh, a couple of years ago when the Science Party was a future party, um, after the 2013 uh, federal election, uh, I was reading through some of the cool future party policies and one of them was the science policy obviously and there was about two sentences in there about space and it said uh, we should do space things. So I called up James and I said, you can do better than that. And he said, you do better than that. And my mind was blown. I didn't realize you could actually do that. And that's the thing that got me to be involved in the science party. Because James said, well, why don't you do it? So then we did. We wrote a space policy, which I think is pretty cool. It's helped out by lots of people, lots of um, people who are in this room, and lots of other experts. By the way, this is the coolest thing, um, I invited uh, Professor Greg Chamatov to be here tonight, and he sends his apologies. This is former NASA astronaut Professor Greg Chamatov. Sends his apologies. He's overseas. He would have been here. He was one of the people that helped out with the, the space policy. Very, very helpful. So the idea of the space policy is to, firstly, there's three parts to it. Firstly, establish an Australian space agency. I think that's a no-brainer, really. <laughs> uh, secondly, become a member of the... Uh, European Space Agency. We've been invited about, I think the last count is three or four times, three times, yeah, uh, and we keep saying no. Um, and the third part is to talk about space infrastructure. Uh, infrastructure means a lot, means lots of things. It means something to me, but I'm not going to say that because it's kind of controversial in a way. But uh, talk about space infrastructure to get space stuff happening here. Uh, the way that the space industry works is that you find a niche and you hammer that niche. Look at what the Canadians did. It's the same thing we keep saying over and over again. They nailed the robotics. So anytime in space there's something to do with robotics, they go to Canada. And what did Canada get out of it? An amazing space program. That's uh, the end of my spiel. So that's basically what the space policy is about. What I'm going to do now is introduce the three people that will talk. Please ask some questions. Uh, during, uh, during their little uh, talk about their involvement in the space policy. And after each of them, we'll have another quick couple of questions uh, that you guys have. 
Firstly, we're going to hear from Dr. Patrick Neumann, who is from Neumann Space up there. After Patty, as he's coming up, we're going to have Dr. Tim Parsons over here from Delta V. And after that, we're going to have Professor Eva Cairns over here from Sydney University. These three people do amazing things, and they're going to tell you about it. Yeah. Is that cool? All right. Let's go. Thanks, Thanks Tom, and thanks for having me down here tonight. So, as mentioned, I'm Dr. Patrick Neumann. I finished my PhD last year at the University of Sydney working on plasma spacecraft propulsion systems. I did an interesting project following on from my master's and my honours projects, taking one of the systems that we have in the School of Physics at the University of Sydney and seeing how well it works as a rocket, effectively. And the numbers I got were rather exciting. They're really cool. However, no one's going to want to buy it until it gets proven to work in space. And if you're going to do this tra the traditional way, then what happens is you do something cool as part of your PhD or a research project, and your national space agency looks at what you've done and goes, yeah, yeah, that's really cool. We should do something with that. And then a couple of budget cycles go by, and eventually something gets built, and it gets launched into space. And it might get demonstrated on a little baby satellite going not very many places in low Earth orbit and everything's cool and you try it in a bit more an ambitious project and that's really awesome and eventually one of the big players like your Airbus, your Boeing, your Lockheed, your Space Systems Loral, one of these big players go, we really like your technology, we'd like to use it and licensing or takeover happens and everything's great. But there's a major obvious problem with this in that we don't have a national space agency in this nation to actually move on with this. We have the Space Policy Unit, which is that's a small, op small office at the back of the Science Ministry. They do some good work, mainly in helping to regulate Australia's space activities. If you're wanting to launch something on somebody else's rocket, you talk to the Space Policy Unit. They make sure everything's checked out when it comes to your engineering tests, and that's all good. That's fine, that's fantastic. But they're not moving forward Australian space and Australian space capabilities. If we had a fairly independent space agency of our own in Australia, they'd be doing whatever is judged to be in Australia's national interest. And much so it pains me to say this, what's in Australia's national interest is probably not giving money to small space startup companies so they can test their rocket engine. And that's okay because what Australia needs is things like Earth observation with our own sensors on our own systems so that we can optimize the data coming down for what exactly we need. If we have, say, Earth observation coming from Japanese weather satellites, this is great for knowing when a typhoon's going to hit. It's great for looking at weather fronts. It's great for all of these things. It's not so good for talking about soil moisture or looking at hyperspectral colorimetry for, uh, how do I put this, forestry, looking at the colors coming back from tree leaves so you can determine if there's anything eating that pine plantation. Do you have to put the, the, the people down there with the, uh, the pesticides to get rid of the weevils eating the pine trees, or is the pine trees okay? Um, all these various cool and interesting things you can do with, with Earth observation we can't do because we don't have a particular body that will do this. So at Neumann Space we looked at this and thought okay what can we do about this? Turns out we went to a conference in Bremen earlier this year and met this wonderful chap Christian, Christian Steimler, he's at Airbus Defence and Space. He's the project manager of their Bartolomeo platform. The Bartolomeo platform is described by Airbus as being like a balcony on the side of the ISS. And like all good balconies, it has a power point. You don't need your own solar panel. You use the ISS power. It's got a fridge. You don't need your own refrigeration system. It's got its own thermal mitigation system, which gets derived from the ISS. We even give you the Wi-Fi password. So you don't need your own communications downlink. You get all of that through the Bartolomeo platform, which goes through the ISS so that we could test our system in space for a year. It gets even better because we don't need our own space. We don't, sorry, we don't need all of our own space. Other 
organizations can have a chat to us and get them get some space on our module to look down at the earth and do this earth observation mission to prove their own sensors to prove that their data is accurate by doing space observation and then graft and then ground tests to calibrate everything similarly you could look forward through the ISS's orbital trajectory and maybe down a little bit and look at the Earth's atmosphere through its thickness. Or if you want to do so, you can look straight upwards and do space observations, space telescopes, possibly track asteroids, possibly just have a look at the wonders of space, possibly do the, uh, the startup that Planetary Resources was trying to do recently where you'd give them a picture and they'd snap a photograph of the Earth's background or the space background from their Archive 3 a satellite, and they'd be able to sell you space selfies. Sure, somebody pays five bucks, ten bucks for that. All you need, that all you need is a few thousand of those, and that's your mission paid for. No worries. It, it, these are options. These are things you can do. So. What we want to do is we want to try and open up space as a commercial and paying proposition because we're a company. Doing things for the benefit of mankind in space is great. However, if you're doing it solely for the benefit of mankind, you're relying on government budgets and they're notoriously prone to changing. If you can do it in such a way that somebody will pay you for that data, even if the people paying for that data are universities who have government grants, that's okay because you have a commercial and paying proposition. You have a business and that business can work forward in future. With our system, we think that we've got a couple of different ways that we can move forward in future and we'd like to continue doing this. As part of, however, back on the main topic of should Australia have a space agency? Yes. Should Australia say yes to the ESA? My oath, yes. Uh, having met some people at IAC in Guadalajara and having had discussions with them, Australia has said no twice and the third time we were asked, it was kind of awkward because the ESA person asked the Premier of Western Australia at the opening of the new, new, of the new Norcia Deep Space Tracking Station. New Norcia is a tiny little hamlet about 120, 150 k's outside of Perth. And the ESA person asked the Premier of WA, who had no idea what to do and didn't tell anyone about this. So a couple of years went by and nothing happened. Mind you, that, that asking happened in 2002, 2003, something like that. We should probably say yes. The membership of ESA is, it has some required mandatory expenditures. But they are based on the GDP of the nation that is joining up. Given that our GDP is about the same size as Canada's, plus or minus 5%, then we can say we'd be paying about the same amount of Canada, which is about 20, 20 and a half million US dollars, I believe is the correct conversion. Let's call it 20, 22 million. We'd immediately get a bunch of that back because New Norcia Deep Space Tracking Station is being run in Australia. And if it's being run in Australia, ESA's rules say that they have to give the contracts for running that station to Australian companies. So that money would be coming back. We'd also get a lot of savings because we no longer have to buy on the open market, open to anyone rates, data from ESA Earth observation satellites, such as weather satellites. So that would be saving a large amount of money coming downstream from the various weather satellites that we use for the six o'clock news. So Bureau of Meteorology would immediately have a saving in its budget that would be that, that would surely show up somewhere. When it comes to doing more interesting, more sexy, more exciting stuff in space, such as human exploration, such as robot exploration, such as putting people on the space station, because Australia would be a member of ESA, that means Australian citizens would have the right to apply as members of ESA's astronaut corps and potentially have Australians in space as Australian citizens. The handful of Australians that have so far been in space have done so because they moved to the US, got US citizenship, in some cases had to renounce their, U their Australian citizenship. So they might have been Australian born, but they're no longer actually legally Australians. And that's crap. You should do better than that. 
Australia was the third nation to launch a satellite from its own territory into space. Admittedly, we bought that rocket off the Americans, but still, Australia used to be a leader in this field. We should be a leader again. Thank you very much for your time. If you have any questions, I'll have you ask. Thanks. So, hi, everybody. Um, thank you so much. Really uh, privileged to be following Patty, who I know is going to be famous one day. Uh, I hope when you get the Nobel Prize, uh, you uh, don't do, you, you know, you accept the prize and the money and tell everybody about it. Um, uh, I'm also really um, proud to be coming before uh, Professor Eva Cairns, who is one of Australia's pioneers in spacecraft design, development and flight, um, and uh, also in the room with Professor Andrew Dempster from UNSW's Australian Centre for Space Engineering Research, who have worked alongside Eva and many other folks to um, launch very small spacecraft to really try and drive Australian know-how and talent in, in action. So, so that's something that I, I, I'm sort of the sandwich. In, in fact, in a way, I'm the, I'm the token capitalist here, uh, in a sense. So, so I'm going to come at this from a slightly different angle for you. Um, this is the core presentation, the core of a presentation I actually gave at New Space 2016 in Seattle a few months ago. Um, so basically the US startup community. So I thought I'd share this, which is why it's called A View from Australia. Uh, because I tried to really tell a little bit of the story of our potential as a country. Um, now, what I wanted to do, the brief tonight, was really to talk a little bit about space and entrepreneurship. So, as part of my day job, I work at a, a company called Pollinizer, which is Australia's first tech incubator accelerator. Uh, and now we work outside of tech, outside of um, web mostly, and in fact we're working in areas like health, uh, energy, food, data, areas where we're actually closer to the applications and, and all using digital technologies to do stuff rather than just say pets.com, right? Which is kind of what a lot of our generation is known for, the, the, all the internet stuff. And this is what I mean we teach people, that actually entrepreneurship is about doing something that's quite tough for engineers and scientists like us, which is embracing uncertainty. Starting projects where you don't have a nice waterfall um, uh, sort of plan of how to get things done. Uh, and you're not really sure how things are going to play out. And I'm still learning this. And this is, this is actually really, really the thing that we have to learn as a country. And we're sort of busy doing that right now, in fact. Um, so what I want to start off, give you a little bit of a frame for this chat, which is the, the classic lean startup life cycle. And basically what we teach folks is that the best way to start a business and is to use science. Uh, and in fact, at Pollinizer, we call it startup science. And the basic premise is, is that first of all, you need to take your idea and turn it inside out and prove if you're solving a real problem. And see if you can do actual experiments with real customers to decide if you're going to solve a real problem. Now, sometimes we actually jump really far into the future and we solve a future problem. So for example, Patty is solving a big, big, big problem, which is how do we get around the solar system really fast? So for him to do experiments is really tough, and that's why we've got to get his stuff flown and get it proven. But for most other businesses in space, we can actually talk to people about the kinds of problems that they're experiencing today. And there is huge, huge value in this. Um, we're talking trillion dollar value in the kinds of problems that are out there and that are emerging now. So I'll talk a little bit more about that. But after, we, after you've done proof of problem, we teach people to do proof of market. Okay, can you get somebody to pay you a dollar for a, a part of that solution? And as a corollary to that, we teach people this MVP, minimum viable product, so you make three number acronyms, but anyway. And the idea is, is that we try not to deliver this, which requires you to go through all these broken stages, we actually try to get people to deliver something that works right at the beginning and see if you can get someone to pay you for that. And one of the big challenges with space is it's been so difficult to do this, so hard, that it's really required us to start here. And pretty much the only people who could do this is defense and giant governments, right? And, and like create, you know, Cold War space races and man on the moon, that kind of stuff. So in a sense, space historically has been captured 
by this approach. Historically, it started here, and the price tag has been hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars, if not billions of dollars. And so I think also, just to be a little kinder to our political system or the way that our government operates, our government has taken the view, successive Liberal and Labor governments have taken the view, that for us to have a space agency, we've had to start here. And in the past, when we funded projects that might be here or here, it hasn't delivered economic return. It hasn't actually proven that, that there's a market, and it hasn't proven that we can scale what we've invested in. So if you look at FedSat, for example, we spent quite a lot of money on FedSat. We did fantastic engineering. The spacecraft lasted, I think, twice as long as it was designed to last. And we got a whole bunch of PhDs. And no companies. No jobs created in a sustainable way. So having been burnt that way, um, they, there has been a reluctance to invest in space. The other thing that we've also been doing is we've been kind of outsourcing this. Australia has been spending quite a lot of money on military space, thanks to our ANZUS alliance. And so they see that line item in the budget and they go, well, we're spending money on space. Uh, the fact that it's all black, and maybe because it's black, outdated in terms of technology, and because we're a bit worried about how secret it all is, not open to all of you guys, okay, well, we'll just put up with that because we get access to the Five Eyes Intelligence Network, we get access, our soldiers on the ground get you know, data when they need it, all these other things they get from that. Although right now, that's about to change because actually we don't think we're getting great value for money. So anyway, keep this in mind. I'm going to come back to this. Let's talk a little about proof of problem. How are we going to do proof of problem? So space startups, why now? Why are we going to do space startups now? The answer is that thanks to miniaturization, space technology has gotten really cheap. Thanks to the sort of technology sitting in this or in the mobile phone in your pocket, we've got amazing cameras, incredible antenna, a huge amount of solid state technology, positioning technology, CPUs, RAM, memory, and so on, that's incredibly cheap. We have all sorts of capabilities that we can put in a very small package and launch cheaply in space. And so what we've seen is that just as PCs transform this access to computing power, these small spacecraft that are literally within the reach of almost hobbyists in some cases could transform how we think about space. And that's in fact been the, the pathway that, that Eva is going to talk a little bit more about, so I don't want to steal this thunder. The economics around this is also interesting. Here's that model I showed you before. Classic Landsat 8 NASA spacecraft. NASA spent a huge amount of money buying that from very big companies. Right? You know in The Martian, where they show that scene of the people at JPL trying to come up with a solution to get it? That doesn't happen with NASA people. That happens with people at Lockheed Martin, at Boeing, at uh, McDonnell Douglas, at Morton Thiokol, at United Launch Alliance, a bunch of people that are getting paid literally hundreds of millions of dollars to try and come up with this. So that's the old model of space. Similarly, recently we've had these spacecraft, $350 million they had to raise, five years to get it built. By the time it flew, it had missed out on all the innovation in optics that you're enjoying in your fresh iPhone 7. It missed out on all the CPU um, leapfrog that, that's gone on and so forth. Um, Google bought this company not long ago, and these guys were a little bit from out of the outside of the space industry, and they managed to get their company acquired, uh, and they, they managed to build their first spacecraft based on pretty much a, a solid Series A, even an angel round from Silicon Valley. And then Planet Labs, they've been flying this small spacecraft. Uh, they uh, were founded partly by an Australian, Chris Position, as their CTO, and they were able to get their costs of their vehicles right down 250k using no aerospace qualified parts, literally almost going to Best Buy in the US and just assembling it from off the shelf stuff, and they managed to stand up a business model. They've certainly had a massive amount of failures. Their spacecraft don't last a hell of a long time, but they've successfully raised 100 million dollars in VC funding and are really disrupting this whole area. So you can see the model. If you jump back to here, this is the old model, and this is the new model we want to get into space. Um, okay, so, okay, why Australia? What have we got as a country that makes us uniquely well suited to do space? Well, first of all, something you may not know is that unique in the world 
we have an incredible area to cover from a strategic point of view. Also, we have all the different kinds of environments that you have all around the world. And we have incredibly dense, smart cities where people are using data like crazy. And we have remote Aboriginal communities where we're just starting to introduce things like solar and battery systems so that they don't have to pay six or $700 a month for Caro, right, to have the standard of life air conditioning, lighting, and so on that we expect down here, in, uh, medical clinics and whatnot. So we have the extremes of social in our country, social range that map to every other part of the world. Um, we, and we have these things. We, we've been looking for airliners that are lost at sea. You know, we go right out here in terms of our, our um, surveillance and needs and so forth. So as a, as, a, as a party that's thinking about Australia's strategic position in the world, right, here's some science for you. Right? We are actually very unique. The other thing is, is we do get quite a bit of data given to us at mates rates because we can collab we can calibrate the southern hemisphere. So again, uh, a lot of the people that are supplying Earth observation data or other data, they're using Australian scientists to calibrate their data for the southern hemisphere, and that way um, our our institutions and so on have been able to develop some amazing capabilities. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about proof of market, this second stage. So we we can see that there's a, a, some great opportunities. There's some interesting changes, there's some new solutions coming up for this problem of how do we solve space. So let's look at some of the Earth's ap applications. Patty mentioned a lot of these, um, but I'm going to just articulate some of them for you. Uh, smart cities and infrastructure. Trillions of dollars is being poured into this because the, the thinking is that every dollar we spend in this area will probably solve us, save us 10 over the next 50 years. Um, similarly, precision agriculture. Australia has actually got a program where we have mapped Australia to two centimetres resolution. Our spatial uh, community has had a national data cube project which has mapped Australia to two centimetres, which is impressive when you think that Australia moves seven centimetres a year north, right, next to continental drift. Why did they map Australia to two centimetres resolution? Because that autonomous robot that's going along, and this is their use case, the autonomous robot that's going along the ground laying uh, fertilizer, right? It does it once. Next season, it comes back. They want that robot to know what it put before so that it can optimize the amount of fertilizer, in fact, reduce the amount of fertilizer that it's using for that same piece of ground. And over time, actually run a predictive model so that every time it goes to that same spot of land, it's actually optimizing what it thinks that the piece of ground will need. So that's just a taste of all the different applications in one of our major export industries. And there's a lot of work going on on the ground. At Polonizer right now, we're incubating a company that is uh, out of the New South Wales Department of Primary Industry that has got a decision support system to tell you which field to put your cows in to make sure that, that the field is protected and the cows get what they need, even in drought. And we think that we can increase the yield of the Australian meat industry by about 20% using just that kind of technology. How are they going to pull that off? They want data from space. They want higher precision data from space. And it goes on, things that we all know about. There is actually no global system for early detection of hotspots, for example, for bushfires. Right? And Literally hundreds of billions of dollars destroyed every year. Global insurance industry is predicting that that's going to increase as climate change accelerates. So we certainly have an opportunity to do an MVP in Australia for bushfires using drones, airships, and ultimately spacecraft. Uh, and I think this is the sort of stuff that, that hopefully you'll recognize requires science and is also really valuable economically. Okay, let's look at some examples. Um, this is the kind of example um, imagery that we're getting from this tiny little spacecraft, they're about that big. Right? Beautiful imagery taken uh, from a five kilogram satellite and then uploaded online into a platform that people can use to mash up. Let's have a look at a market data application whereby people want to short or long uh, the cost of energy based on data that they're gathering using imagery. Right? So this is an example of oil storage tanks where a machine has taken photos of lots of different oil storage tanks, rotated them all so the shadows are all in the same corner, and then measured who's hoarding and who isn't, so that they could get an indication of the future price of that commodity. Right? That's an example. 
worth literally to the to the city worth literally hundreds of billions of dollars of market intel. Of course, you can see that for cotton production, rice production, fundamental uh, commodities in all different sectors, even mining. Let's talk about mining. Here's a fascinating uh, Canadian example: a company that was spun out of the Canadian space program, uh, although they they uh, they have this technology which can detect elevation change from space. So here's an elevation map of a giant pit mine in, uh, in, uh, in Canada. And they actually knew, using ground technology, using people on the ground surveyors, they knew that there was a fault line in this area. So they were watching it really carefully because they were a bit worried that it might break. But as you can see, this imagery which has been actually created by multiple repeat passes of the spacecraft using LiDAR, um, they were able to pick up this area. And that, that there was a slippage occurring in this area that none of the ground instruments showed, right? It's called INSAR, so Synthetic Aperture Radar. Lots of passes of LiDAR and radar, and then the, you accumulate them over time as a time series, take out the noise, and bam, millimeter scale, right? And that's what happened. Here's the fault that they were watching, and here's where it broke, right? So, thanks to this data, they were able to predict that this was going to happen, and they moved people out of the way. Unfortunately, this didn't happen in Brazil, where a major Australian company, BHP, lost half its market cap because of a similar disaster. The people at head office, who had all the liability, had no visibility of what was going on at the mine site. Classic data problem, classic science problem, applied science problem. Um, let's look at another application. This is a fantastic Australian company located in Adelaide called Fleet, and they have a very, very, very aggressive um, project to fly a constellation of spacecraft for IoT connectivity, for environmental, for the declining oil and gas industry to make sure they're not wasting, or also sensors around all sorts of different areas, uh, remote area, agriculture, um, low bandwidth stuff. And uh, this company is also um, probably going to be in the news uh, in, in a little while because they pulled off some pretty amazing uh, successes commercially. Small space startup company based in Adelaide and they also have an office here in Sydney. Um, so go check them out, fleet.space is a URL, you'll see what they're doing. Um, and again, uh, space is, you know, crack for geeks, right? We love it. Uh, any space story usually gets a massive amount of click throughs, and so there, there's certainly a lot of money in the media sponsorship realm, which we aren't not, aren't really tapping. And, it, and you may or may not know this, but Australia probably wins more Cannes Lions, which is a marketing industry um, award, than any other country in the world per capita. We are amazing at marketing and branding and telling stories. Uh, so we 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 need to use the fact that space stories and space projects get great click-through rates. Okay, and of course, really important, Australia, we need to inspire our kids to study science and engineering and mathematics and biology and these things. And so space is pretty sexy, it's pretty exciting, and also, of course, being a capitalist, education is a huge global industry, uh, and we need to improve it. We need kids to be more self-directed, to be more project-based in their learning, to fall in love with things at a deeper level and not just do rote, not just do stupid exams and tests all the time, actually do cool stuff. Um, because we want to work for these guys when we're older, right? And they're the bosses and they're employing us. And so we want them to be as smart as we can make them. And we also want them to be rational and making decisions about things using data and science. Okay, so one more little complicated thing, and this is the science party, but I think it's important from a policy point of view. Um, uh, this is a business model 101. Uh, so when we often think about space, when you talk to members of the general public, you'll notice I haven't shown lots of pictures of spaceships, people floating around, really cool stuff like that, and that's because I wanted to show this value chain model. All of the things that I've been talking about are big scale problems that the end customers have. Right? And essentially, the value, the big value opportunities are here and here. And so, pa Patty, I actually think we should be more ambitious. I don't think Australia needs to take on a specific niche. 
We already founded Atlassian, which is the world's top project management company, right, already. We also, also already have some incredible uh, technologies coming out of our universities and our startups around data and applications. So I think we have the opportunity to nail these areas, actually. There's no Atlassian yet in incredible data cubes for smart cities or for precision agriculture, right, or for decision support systems for how we handle water quality. Who's responsible when a pollution event happens upstream of a reef or something? We have the ability to create these companies and scale them really quickly. Um, and what we want to do, what I personally want to do, and certainly Patty and the other speaker want to do, is to anchor our Australian infrastructure, space infrastructure, vehicles, missions on this economic pyramid, right? And so we need to partner at all levels. Um, and another way to think of that is, is validation, going back to that startup model. As we get these customers who say, I want to use a bit of space in my solution, as they do bring in space data into a data solution, we get more and more validation for investing in new companies that are solving problems and flying hardware, right, launching equipment, partnering with European and American companies, uh, and so forth. Uh, and then in this, wor in this world, something like the joining the European Space Agency program and standing up our own space agency is a no-brainer. Without a value chain model like this, it seems like it's just another research project that won't necessarily create value for wider society. So I think that subtlety has been lost in a lot of cases in the argument that's been made in the past. And the timing now I think is perfect given the current uh, mindset of both the, both the major parties and of course uh, many others around entrepreneurship. Okay, I'm nearly finished. Sorry, you've, you've been very patient with me. So um, proof of scale, the final one. Can we take this Australian ideas and actually is there a huge global market for this stuff? Because I've been telling you there is, but is there really? You know. Um, so let's look at Australia. Um, we have huge markets for space on our doorstep. So here we are. I actually made a mistake when I was in America and I bumped our population up by 5 million. <laughs> Bad. Uh, but anyway, uh, we have a GDP of around $2 trillion and we're growing at zip. Right? Advanced economy, struggling, trying to figure out stuff. We haven't had a big GFC. We haven't been minus 5% thanks to Chinese demand for our, uh, primarily Chinese demand for our raw materials. Okay, hold on to this number, two trillion, right? And this number, 25 million, right? Okay, ASEAN, over 20 times more people. 20 times more people. GDP, 20% more? Average age, one third of this population is less than 20. And they all have a quad core Snapchat smartphone in their hand, or have got one in the last two or three years. This is the fastest growing area in the world. And in fact, if you go up there and you meet the people who are running companies, who are in government, who are doing things in this area, a lot of them went to university, you know where. Right? And they speak English, and some of them are even Sharks supporters, or Collingwood supporters. Right? Uh, I have met a government person in Malaysia at, a, at an event where I was up there a few months ago, and they were a Collingwood supporter. And they were bitching about how Collingwood didn't really do that well. Um, uh, so we have incredible social connections with this group, and we just don't realize it. And we don't get our butts up there with MVPs and put them into market. So that's definitely something that's important. Another aspect of of this scale. Um, in 2010, this is the world according to Facebook. Well, of course, America, of course, Western Europe, but increasingly, lots of other places where there is more and more people, 2010, right? Let's look at the middle, let's look at the world's middle class today, where these applications are happening. So today, world's middle class, 322 million Arguably, maybe that's a bit lower since the GFC because they've really suffered and they've, they've been struggling. And 525 million, and only 100 million in Africa. So look at these numbers. Now look at where we're going by 2030. Static, doubled. Tripled, doubled. 6x. Huge, 
huge movement of people up the value chain who need to be more efficient in how they consume everything. They need to be more efficient in, how, in, in waste, in energy, in food production. They need more data. They need smarter systems. They want to leapfrog. Right? They're not going to be building massive power stations all over the place. They're going to be installing massive household solar and electric. Right? They, get, they want to do e-medicine now because they can't afford our, our, our way of doing medicine. Um, and they're younger countries as well. There's a whole lot of uh, work, co-working spaces, massive investment in tech companies, and people all in Africa are all getting smartphones and doing things with smartphones that we, we haven't even come close to yet. Um, and uh, so we're seeing the world look very different. So I think the scale is there. So sort of in conclusion, um, space is a is a is an industry which has traditionally been pretty much captured by the let's call it the military industrial complex, the government complex. And we've got some fantastic things out of that, right? GPS completely transformed our lives. You know, if I need to know where my 14 year old son is, I go on to find my phone. Like, and I could pin him right where he is, thanks to GPS. And in fact, that has probably saved billions and billions of, of liters of, of, of petrol, just in terms of how taxi drivers drive around and the rest of us drive around. So we have had fantastic applications from this world, but it's not sustainable. And governments can't afford it anymore. They need to spend all their money on healthcare and on transitioning out of the carbon economy and all these other things. So we believe it's time for, for that partnership between the entrepreneurship and all the infrastructure that that world created, and we've got to get we've got to get sustainable B corps. We've got to get sustainable uh, 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 companies uh, involved in space. Um, so, in conclusion, um, let's let's do it because uh, at the end of the day, we should prove uh, that we can, and I think I believe we can. Thank you very much. Okay, so um, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, Tom asked me to talk about two things. Uh, one of them was thoughts about space policy in Australia, and the other being some of the things we're doing at the University of Sydney. Um, the reason for the latter is, of course, that well, here in Australia we've had no spacecraft of our own put into space uh, for 15 years. Uh, we are lagging in many ways behind the rest of the world. And yet, why should our government change anything if we can't actually put our teams together, put our efforts together to actually put something into space? They need to see that something has changed and that we can actually do it before they will want to invest. Or at least that's a reasonable way of looking at it. And so I will talk a bit about, um, about the Inspire2 uh, project, which is a team uh, project, just as a way of showing that before the end of next year, uh, we should have three Australian-built spacecraft in space, all launched from the International Space Station, all of them CubeSats, uh, two of them at least partially built by the University of New South Wales, one at the University of Sydney uh, with our UNSW colleagues and ANU, uh, and then one from South Australia, so distributed across the nation. All of them a little bit different, all of them using commercial off-the-shelf parts for some things, but their own payloads. And we're going to actually have something in space, putting, putting footsteps towards actually having a demonstrable capability to put things into space, to do space science, and to perhaps create a space industry. So let me start off with, um, with what we're doing in Inspire2, uh, and then we'll get to eventually to my thoughts about space policy, which might or might not be uh, different from others. And I'll just mention that I, I do have some, some uh, claim to credibility uh, there. I uh, was the leader for the Decadal Plan for Australian Space Science, developed under the Academy of Science, and um, uh, released in 2010. It's now about halfway through. Uh, some parts have, been, um, have succeeded, those parts which haven't relied upon government funding. Other parts which have relied upon government funding have not yet. But it is a blueprint uh, for how we might go in the, in the space slash public good uh, part of uh, work. And then things that uh, Tim Parsons has mentioned and, and Patty uh, are relevant to the space industry part of the equation. So anyway, 
um, I inspire. Uh, two and uh, the Australian third Australian CubeSat uh, for the QB50 project. You can see rather a lot of people here, something like uh, 20 people um, from three institutions, as you can see here in the logo, uh, from the Australian National University, the University of New South Wales, and from the University of Sydney. The bottom line is that this team is intending to put together, rather, I'll put that's out of place, has already put together and delivered to Europe a fully functioning uh, spacecraft, which should be integrated uh, by the American firm Nanorax, go up to the space station on an Antares rocket. The date now is the 17th of February uh, next year, and it should be released uh, into space in early March. And while it's there, it will look at the Earth's ionosphere and thermosphere. Looks a little bit like a spider. We have uh, eight legs, two, or all of them, uh, four um, booms out the front for, for looking at the density and temperature of the ionospheric plasma and four out behind uh, to, um, uh, to communicate back to Earth with. This really is a team effort. You can see a number of us here at our celebration event on August 9th uh, when we finally got the spacecraft together. We were about to ship it uh, to Europe. And you can see a number of them here. We've got um, Christine Charles from ANU and uh, Andrew Dempster, who's uh, towards the back on, the, on my left, your right. Um, and then you can see a cast of characters, uh, other people from ANU, Rod Boswell, and then a bunch of people here, including Jiro Funamoto and Wayne Peacock, who did much of the actual building of the spacecraft. But a team effort wouldn't be where we, were, we are without it being a large team working together, without it using commercial off-the-shelf parts bought from overseas, but complemented by our own payloads. So I'll talk a little bit about some firsts and reasons to care, a little bit about QB50, then something about the taste of the science, and then building it, and then eventually get to the space policy. So this will be rather quick. I'm going to try and uh, adhere to the 10 minutes that I was told I was given, um, despite my, uh, my predecessors having uh, <laughs> ignored it. <laughs> so anyway. Um, so what about some firsts for our spacecraft? And I, I guess I should say INSPIRE-2 stands, stands for Integrated Nanospectrograph Imager and Radiation Explorer. So it does have a name, uh, or rather a set of um, uh, reasons why it's called this, rather than just wanting to be inspiring, although of course that's, a, that's the pun uh, here, the reason for we have the third one. We have our uh, South Australian colleagues in AU01 and then our UNSW-only colleagues in there. But we should be the first, th first Australian spacecraft released from the space station, the first Australian-built spacecraft for 15 years. You know, all of the ones for uh, Optus and MBN, they're all built overseas. They're not Australian-built. Most of them aren't even Australian-designed in any reasonable sense. Those should even then be only the fourth, fifth, and sixth spacecraft uh, that are Australian uh, built, put into orbit. Uh, so even if we were the third nation on Earth to put something into orbit from our own uh, territory, we've lagged behind quite a lot. They will be our first CubeSats. And I would argue the most important aspect is that they offer a route uh, towards a sustainable world-class space research community and space industry. Sustainability is obviously important. We've heard a bit here about the diaspora of Australians overseas wanting to come back. Well, if we want them to come back, we have to have a sustainable uh, space community. And it's got to be more than just the academics. It's got to be definitely more than just industry, because otherwise you often won't have the new ideas and technology to, for the products and new services. Uh, we need to work together. And arguably, from a government point of view, it's the only viable path to satisfy our satellite utilization policy, which is our de facto space policy. It actually went to cabinet the first time uh, called the national space policy. And it was luckily for us, I think, um, re renamed uh, the space, uh, you, sorry, the satellite utilization policy. Uh, you, you, I like to use the word spacecraft rather than satellite, but in this case, satellite utilization policy, um, which does say that the, the nation needs to have reliable, 
access to space for the data on which we intrinsically depend. The only way to do that really is to have your own space capability. Otherwise you're relying upon others, which you can do sometimes when they want you to, but not otherwise. Okay. So QB50, it's a European Union uh, project to basically take 50 cubes. So that's the cube, QB, cubes, cubes, cube, CubeSat spacecraft, 50 of them, put them into orbit um, and have them go in a constellation, but a random constellation, uh, through the upper atmosphere of the Earth. In particular, from about now, about 400 kilometers altitude, so through the, the lower part of the Earth's ionosphere, down into the thermosphere, and then eventually burn up once we get to 90 kilometers and uh, die a fiery death. As one of my colleagues, uh, some of you will have seen the catalyst recently. It's now two catalyst episodes ago. Um, and Elias uh, Brutineus from UNSW loved talking about um, this being a suicide mission. And, uh, and he said, for a good cause. And I suspect it's true that most people committing suicide believe it is for a good cause. But, <laughs> but anyway. Anyway, 50 of them uh, to probe the Earth, three of them from Australia which is a surprisingly large number for a country without a space agency or a national space policy. So a taste of the science. Basically, here we are um, down on Earth right at the bottom. Uh, 10 kilometers is about uh, where your jet uh, planes go, so 30,000 feet if you're old-fashioned, 10 kilometers. So the stratosphere is where we might get up to with weather balloons, up to about 50 k's. Um, here, roughly 80 kilometers. It's really about where the, um, where the aurora might be. And this is about where energetic electrons and protons coming back down from space get to about this height, most of them, before they um, undergo collisions, etc., and they don't get any further. And we're going to be, and this is where we have the, really the start of major ionization of the atmosphere, which once it gets to here is roughly 50% ionized and 50% neutrals. And if you're a plasma physicist like me, you only really care about the plasma, which is 99% of the mass of the visible universe. Uh, but for others, they like neutrals. Uh, and this is the domain for the space shuttle. And we'll be um, injected somewhere up here, about 425 kilometers altitude from the space station, and then come down to about here. So basically QB50 is all about the science of the upper atmosphere. Um, plasma and neutrals, it's about changes to Earth's environment as a function of time. It's about space weather, and what space weather means is the effects on human technology and society of events from space, mostly driven by the sun, so solar driven space weather. And you see all sorts of lovely things. Um, Daily, of course, we have at any point on Earth uh, sunset and sunrise, so the start of the sun shining um, onto the plasma and the neutrals in the upper atmosphere, ionizing some of them, heating them, causing motions uh, through the ionosphere and the, and the upper atmosphere, waves, all sorts of exotic fun things. They change with, um, with uh, season. And perhaps you might say, well, why do I care about what's happening up there? Well, if you have ionization, you usually have currents. Time-varying currents give rise to magnetic fields. Magnetic fields that change in time give rise to electric fields. And so on the ground, we have lots of nice long uh, conductors, whether these are just the roofs of um, semiconductor factories or we're talking about power lines. When you have large electric fields induced on those, you get currents. Those currents, if they're on a power line, happily move along. Uh, to transformers, and if the currents are large enough, they can destroy the transformer, leaving you without any power. Uh, this happened in Quebec in 1989 on the 13th of March, leaving something like 6 million people without power uh, for a order a day or two. 2003, a similar event. You might say, well, who cares about a few million people without power uh, for a day or two? Well, uh, the first uh, major solar flare and space weather event that was observed was in 1859. And you might have heard of it. It's called the Carrington event. It's a day uh, when power, um, telegraph wires dripped fire 
across Australia, for instance, due to them being mostly metal, of course, large electric fields induced, currents, um, you've got uh, voltages that were large compared with the background, you've got di um, essentially little lightning flashes uh, ca causing fires over many, many parts of the world. Uh, if that happened today, the prediction is that it would have could have taken out the American East Coast power system to the extent that it wouldn't have recovered for roughly 10 years because the, the transformers are built in China, a couple a year. You can imagine even just the East Coast of Australia without power for 10 years. Uh, huge economic dislocation, death, famine on a wide, spread, on a wide scale, uh, even worse for the Americans, of course. And that could happen just about anywhere in the world. So space weather really does matter, uh, and we shouldn't, and this is just one part of it. So, okay, lots of background. What about, uh, here's a little spacecraft, our Inspire 2 uh, spacecraft, um, SolidWorks uh, images. You can see here the outside with the solar cells, with, in this case, the, um, the multi-needle Langmuir probe coming down, and uh, these, these ones here are the communications antennas coming from the other end. I could go through this for lots of time. Be great fun, no doubt. The important thing from your point of view probably is that we have many individual boards with many components on them. Some of them are commercial off the shelf. For instance, um, um, here the, uh, which one do I want to go to? This one here is the uh, computer um, system. Here we've got the spacecraft power supply. Here we've got the attitude determination control system, etc., etc. These are all commercial off-the-shelf parts, so COTS parts, and these are the people who designed them. So really, the important thing to, to point out here is that we do have the capability to design these quite easily now, or relatively easily, uh, at least. Um, and you can use commercial off-the-shelf parts, which are you know modestly expensive. We're talking about 80000 to perhaps $100,000. You might say, well, that's quite a lot of money. But it's a small fraction of most people's houses. It's about uh, you know, a fifth of a, a Boost Juice franchise. In many ways, it's a trivial amount of money. So here are some of the commercial off-the-shelf parts. You see they come in natty little uh, cases like this with all sorts of things like your solar cells happily designed here. Uh, great fun putting them together. So all advertised that everything will slot together nicely. This is not true. Um, it takes a lot more work than that. But here's some of the first stacks. And the dates that are... I've got April 22nd here as an important date. The reason it's important is that we really started this project on the 28th of September last year. So that's six months to be designed, to have a spacecraft designed, to be starting to build it. To have it fully integrated by the 26th of June, here we are at the uh, Advanced Instrumentation and Technology Center at Mount Stromlo uh, near ANU. And here we have our happy little spacecraft. Here it is in a thermal vacuum chamber, um, which I wasn't going to show you any pretty slides to this, so I haven't, uh, except that I guess I'll just tell you that this is in a chamber which is something like four meters in diameter, so rather large compared with me, eight meters long. This thing is pumped down to 10 to the minus nine of an atmosphere. Um, you can change the temperature of your spacecraft and everything, but you know, from minus 20 degrees um, Celsius to plus 50, you can put your spacecraft through all sorts of lovely um, tests. You can make it do amusing things like um, uh, turn its GPS receiver on and detect, this is the University of New South Wales GPS receiver, and prove that it's in Canberra rather than on the other side of the world. You can deploy the antennas, which is what's happened here. It's a great deal of fun, and it's in Australia. And this sort of thing we have to have to be able to test our spacecraft and make sure that they are certifiable uh, for flight. Uh, and those tests are accepted by groups like NASA, ESA, NanoRags, etc. So this is another part of the capability that we have now in Australia. So I'm really going to finish here with regards to Inspire 2 by saying we've taken 10 months 
to go from start to delivery and acceptance in Europe. We've got novel science and technology, which I haven't emphasized at all really, but five payloads, four of them built and designed and everything here in Australia. Um, we're de-risking using commercial off-the-shelf parts and relatively small changes in design from the UNSW spacecraft, and it's involved strong collaborations, and yet we are ready to go uh, to the International Space Station. Subject to a little minor thing was NanoRacks engineers finally getting to Europe uh, to integrate our spacecraft into a pod. Um, but you probably would have noticed that um, just about one week ago, uh, the first version of the redesigned Antares launched uh, into space. We're the second, we're going to take the second redesigned Antares. Uh, so this was a rate determining step for us. Um, and luckily it worked fine. And we're now rescheduled to go on the 17th of February. Okay, so um, future in space, Tim has really emphasized, he's talked about this, but this slide's a little bit different. Just looking at the global uh, economy for space-based uh, systems and services, roughly 300 billion. <coughs> and a rather uh, old-fashioned, but you can't read it, uh, but um, analysis suggested that it'd be only double by, fact, by 2030, you know, 13 years, 14 years from now. I think that's clearly an underestimate. It's going to be more like a factor of 10, I think. Um, but serious money is the point. 300 billion. If Australia can get in, even only 1% of that, it's a major contributor to our nation. You've seen this already. CubeSats really is the way to go in many ways. They're small. They're, uh, e they're, you can make them relatively quickly. You can buy many of the parts off the shelf and make the ones you really need. They can be designed, launched relatively cheaply. They're cheap enough that you can afford to fail. Now, none of us wants to fail, but if you, build, if you can build five, let's say for under a million dollars, you build five, and if only three of them work, you're much better off than building a $10 million or $20 million spacecraft. So this is the way that we see the future coming. Uh, huge numbers of these, low cost of entry, and that leads on into these thoughts, at least for space policy in Australia. So what do we really want? I would argue we want a national, rather than just one university or two. Sustainable, so it's not just a flash in the pan, which arguably FedSat was, unfortunately, and the earlier efforts were. We want it to be a space research and utilization program, not just research, certainly not just utilization otherwise, because that will stagnate and die. It needs to be both. It needs to have funding that's dedicated. How much? Well. You could look at the Canadian example, and the number there is something like, um, I think, $200 million a year. Someone can correct me. We don't have to be nearly that big. Uh, we could have a very important and, and, and uh, viable and world-class um, system for something more like $20 million a year. That's the sort of number that is trivial for a government, obviously large for most of us. Um, it's a reasonable place to start. I would argue we don't necessarily need a space agency. Perhaps heretical for some in the room, um, but it doesn't have to be a space agency. It has to have. It has to be a suitable entity to be able to um, link with other, or rather, uh, national, uh, international space agencies. It's got to have a leader that's more than just a, a relatively junior public servant. Um, the current staff at the, space, at the Space Coordination Office are excellent, they're well-meaning, but it is um, demeaning uh, to send somebody who is, let's say, um, well, I don't know what, this will sound bad, um, especially for, for, for the audience. Um, but let's say somebody who's been out of university for perhaps five years, got some legal background, very competent young person, and this person is meant to be dealing with um, 
um, let's see, uh, General Charlie Bolden from the United States as the head of NASA. I think this goes down well? Not really. Does it look as though we value space? No. So we do need to have a suitable entity, suitable leaders. We don't have them at the moment. Have to work together. Um, we've got to leverage what we have. So we do have a decadal plan for Australian space science. We do have a strategic plan for Earth observations from space. We have a couple, a similar thing for GPS. Those are not obviously enough because we have them already and we don't have a space effort, a national space effort. But they provide something to ground your policy with. And the time is arguably now. Um, the British, for instance, and Tim will correct me on the numbers, um, have decided to try and get 10% of the international space economy. They've invested, I believe the number is $1 billion over 10 years. So you know, $100 million extra a year. You know, serious chunk of change. But you're going for 10% of a $300 billion a year market. It's clearly cost effective. They've done the sums too. They realize that the multipliers for at least for economic activity versus um, investment in research. It's at least four. So even if you take a billion, minimum economic return you expect is $4 billion. Public good is vital. Our current government uh, loves the idea of industry and commercial aspects driving everything. That's what uh, the Space Policy Unit has been trying to do in the Department of Industry, etc. Been trying to do for the last, well, let's say conservatively 20 years. You can see how well it's worked. Um, one major reason is because they, in my opinion, they didn't involve academia. So, for instance, you look at the Australian Space Research Program, you know, $40 million, serious chunk of change uh, from the Rudd government, but they required that it be, if not led by an industry group, it had to have major inputs from an industry group. None of those projects, except perhaps the UNSW GPS receiver, has actually led to anything sustainable, I would argue. And the re one major reason is that us academics who weren't involved said, we'll do our own thing, thanks. Didn't get involved. So you need to involve public good. It is relevant to point out that NASA, ESA, JAXA, all of the international space agencies are roughly 50% public good research, 50% commercial slash defense, slash defense. And usually, of course, for NASA, the defense stuff has been hived off into the black areas of DOD. Um, but you've got to have both. I'd argue that CubeSats and NanoSats are a crucial, if not the only sensible point of entry for Australia. Uh, economically, you know, it's only $250,000 roughly for a CubeSat like Inspire2, and that's including, if not all, then a major fraction of the salaries involved. The actual cash is closer to $130,000. You know, so really, a relatively trivial amount of money. It's certainly within uh, the realm of, for a startup. But these are very capable. Uh, they can do lots of state-of-the-art things. Look at Planet Labs, for instance. They're all CubeSats. $100 million, $100 million of venture capital. This is the way we should go. Cheap cost of entry, very capable. We can use commercial off-the-shelf parts where we want. Research is relevant. Commercial interests and defense. So we cover everyone. And we've actually just about to get runs on the board. Arguably, we should say we, um, I certainly argue that we're a success already because we've created three space qualified spacecraft that have been delivered. But we've got to get them into orbit, yes. Uh, but arguably, we have runs on the board. We can do this. We don't have to rely upon some fairy godmother or godfather to come along and, um, and do it for us. We can do this. From another point of view, the government point of view, some of you will know that there are revisions ongoing to the Space Activities Act. Uh, this is the act that's 
that's specifically relevant to Australia's signing of the Copuis uh, Treaty of the United Nations Treaty uh, must now be 60 years ago, uh, but the Outer Space Treaty, uh, under which Australia is a launching state, would be liable for um, economic and other damage caused by um, things that it put into orbit or tried to put into orbit. Um, <coughs> And that relates to the finance and the insurance requirements, which are very onerous. Um, you know, you look at a, a launch, and often you can you can argue that the maximum probable loss is, let's say, thirty million dollars, and that's all very well. Except usually the rule of thumb for costing is that you know at least five percent of that of that amount of loss will be your insurance premium. So you can imagine how thrilled a university or a startup is if it's if the first thing to be said is well 1.5 million dollars, you know five percent of 30, uh, for your insurance liabilities. Most of us are not going to pay that. Our, I, I in fact went to our university um, insurance office and tried to get a quote, and they said uh, for one million dollars it was a factor of 10 around 50 thousand dollars. But that seems to be going. All of our three QB50 spacecraft and the um, and the and the um, the ATFA or UNSW Canberra spacecraft have had those, and the Cube Rider work has had the, those insurance liabilities waived by the current government, by Minister Hunt, to be precise, to give him his due. Um, at least for most of us, I guess Cube Rider would be Minister Pine. That's likely to continue. So again, another thing which is indicating that government at least wants to change things. And for some of you, there has been a consultation period. Uh, that was earlier, it closed a while ago, but I suspect that if the Science Party has ideas that they want to input, the worst that can happen is that you propose them, you send them in, and they ignore them. That's the worst. If they're good ideas, and you could send it privately to Stephen Freeman, uh, who's uh, the lead on it from the University of Western Sydney. Um, you know, if he's got those ideas, he'll work with them. So really, I think these are my points about space policy. It's where I'd like to, uh, to finish. Um, I'd argue CubeSats are the way. Uh, we're getting, if we don't already have, runs on the board, uh, low cost of entry, everything's going for it. It's a way that we can build a sustainable um, uh, research program and utilization uh, program. Yes, we will probably want to build somewhat bigger spacecraft one day, but let's start where we can, make a difference and grow. That's all I'd like to say.